Notice that the first category has a note, a request for clarification. Um, uh, we will have uh, some of our organizers, who are myself, uh, Carrie Jordan, Alicia Kral, and Marianne Korvalek, um, will be monitoring the Etherpad during the talk. And so if there's anything that really seems to require an interruption for clarification, we will, uh, we will do that for you. Um, so, um, There, you may, when uh, there is a screen share on, you may find it difficult to toggle back and forth to the etherpad. Um, just notice that if you hover up at the bottom, at the top of the screen, uh, you should be, find some view options where you can um, make the full screen go down if you need to do that. Um, any questions about the format before I continue? All right. Um, so, in that case, it is my great pleasure to introduce our guest, Dr. Rochelle Trachtenberg. Um, as many of you know, that we, we recently had a community discussion about a paper <coughs> that called into question the effectiveness of short courses overall. Um, in our response, a key position that we took was uh, recognition that short format training is limited uh, based on what we know about cognitive psychology. Uh, but that we have to do our best within that limitation because the reality is that uh, there is no other way to meet training needs under the circumstances of huge demand and limited expertise. So Dr. Trachtenberg's comments, and a huge thank you to Jason Williams for soliciting those comments, uh, were instrumental in solidifying that position in our community. Uh, but as a follow-up to that, and specifically a follow-up to our commitment to do the best that we can to be effective uh, in the context that we work in, we've invited Dr. Trachtenberg here to speak with us and to share her expertise on the subject in more detail. <clears throat> Dr. Trachtenberg is the Director of the Collaborative for Research on Outcomes and Metrics at Georgetown University, uh, where she's a tenured professor in the Department of Neurology. She holds two PhDs, one in cognitive science and one in measurement and statistics, and is a fellow of the AAAS and the American Statistical Society. Thank you so much for joining us today, uh, Dr. Trachtenberg. I'll go ahead and hand it over. Great. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I want to thank everybody for making time on a busy Friday uh, to to listen to some comments about short and long form training, um, particularly with respect to uh, my background. Obviously, my first PhD is in cognitive science and the second PhD in, in uh, measurement and statistics was in a program in the College of Education. So um, I spend my days thinking about how graduate and postgraduate uh, learners learn and interact with new material. Basically, that's uh, pretty much what I do. Um, but to pay the bills, I am a statistician. So I do spend some time thinking about how graduate and undergraduate um, and professional uh, students think about statistics and learn about statistics. So I'm definitely not a data scientist. I'm a straight up experimental designer and I analyze data from experimental designs. But I think that the um, uh, data and software carpentries audiences face or the instructors for those audiences they face some of the same uh, challenges that i have experienced so um, these comments come from both uh, the literature and also from um, my experience so just to recap the uh, proceedings of the national academy of sciences 2017 paper found that what the short sharp intense training uh, experiences do not have the desired effects on early stage scholars. Now, what's important about this report is no cognitive psychologist would be surprised by these results. And in fact, uh, I've been doing this for 25 years, um, know that it's, we've been wondering why people are doing this and funding it and exploring it and whatever, when we could tell you um, that it wouldn't work. But what's important is that now you have some evidence about specific effects and we will be actually talking quite a lot about what exactly is desired when you engage in either short or long form training or education. Um, one of the things that is most desired, every instructor wants this, whether the institution within which they operate cares or not, is long term retention. So you come to your introductory statistics course with me, which you wouldn't, <laughs> I don't recommend it. But if you did, I would want you to remember or retain, not just retain, but build on the knowledge that you gain in the course um, that you take with me. 
in order for that to happen, because this is how brains work, you actually need to integrate the information and the skills that you start to build in my class into the repertoire that you use every day. So that's a really important thing. It's not just that the desired result is long-term retention or building on the training, but the fact is that won't happen if you don't integrate these new skills. And maybe in some cases, what you want is that um, the result of your training is that the trainees either see themselves or begin to act like members of the community that they're being sort of trained to join. So those are desired effects of all short form and long form training. It's not specific to, to short uh, form. But the 2017 findings reiterate, not discover, that new thinking patterns require more than short, sharp, focused, or intense training. And another thing that we are not going to have time to talk about here, but I'm happy to discuss, is when you look at how, and the Felden et al. paper talks about it, when you look at how impact is measured, if you ask a person how they feel the impact is going, they are likely to be suffering from this Kruger-Dunning paradox, which is uniform, always found, replicated across multiple um, domains, and that is the less skilled you are, the better you think you're doing at whatever it is you're talking about. So that is even more extreme when what you're talking about is a set of rules that you should follow, a recipe or a, a program, for example. So it's really important to keep in mind that what you do, what you desire, that's uh, something to keep at the head of the list of what to do, but also when you are evaluating whether or not what you did was effective, obviously you need to think about what was desired because effect or effectiveness is with respect to what was desired. But you have to be thinking in the back of your mind, if I ask any given person, what do you want? What do you need? They're not likely to be able to tell you correctly. They may tell you what's on their honest belief of what they need, but it doesn't mean that that's what's going to be um, that's actually what they need. Okay, so I am unable to change my slides. Okay, so this is what we're just gonna talk about today. What to do when any cognitive scientist will tell you, you're not gonna get what you desire from a short form or an intense training. There are lessons for what to do that come from education. And I include Bloom's, Bloom's taxonomy. Many of you may have heard about it. Uh, many of you may not realize that it was published in book form in 1956 as the result of a years-long consensus-based effort. The uh, features of Bloom's taxonomy, which we will go over, have existed since 1956. They have been replicated. They have been utilized. There hasn't been a lot of change to Bloom's taxonomy because it is a really accurate representation about how complexity in thinking evolves over time. Another thing that you're definitely not going to be familiar with is three questions about, um, about what you're teaching and what you think the, dis the end result of your teaching will be or should be. That uh, was originally formulated in the late 80s, but was published uh, succinctly in 1994 by a psychometrician. So that's not uh, something that a lot of people will have heard about, but I find it, I find these questions very, very coherent and really helpful to me as I think about what what I desire when I embark in a training um, session or to design some kind of a, a learning experience. So the lessons that we will get from education for dealing with problems that arise in short form, achieving what we would desire from a short form training um, are amplified with a couple lessons from cognitive science, specifically about sustainability of learning or sustainable learning and metacognition. And then hopefully we'll have time to talk about the lessons from the carpentries specifically based on their strategies. So as I mentioned, you may be familiar with Bloom's taxonomy. If you're not, here's a quick uh, review. You should Google Bloom's 1956 and you'll find just scads of information about Bloom's taxonomy. But specifically, it has six levels. The first level is to remember, simply to remember or repeat or reiterate. The sixth level, the fifth and sixth level, create and synthesize and evaluate, compare or judge, differ from simple memorization in absolutely every, every conceivable way. Not only is it more complex 
to evaluate. But the way I know you're evaluating is more complex than the way I know you're remembering. I just ask you, do you remember what I just said? That's how I know if you can remember what I just said. But in order for you to evaluate what I just said, it's you have to have a lot more information in order to do the evaluation. It's much more complex. So remember is the first level, then understand or summarize, then apply or illustrate, then analyze or predict. Levels one through four are really, really focused on um, taking what you know and working with what you know using rules that you can see and everyone can see. So consistency is much more straightforward when an individual is operating at Bloom's levels one through four. And when operating at Bloom's level five and six, it's very difficult. So it's difficult to assess. You have to have someone generate some narrative or tell you what they've done. If they've synthesized something new out of existing things, you can't just have a multiple choice question to evaluate that. That means it's real, since it's really hard to assess, sometimes it isn't assessed. And in fact, if you look through all the multiple choice exams you've ever taken, literally over the first four years of your um, educational career in college, um, most of the items that you've answered will be remember or understand, maybe a little bit of illustrate or apply, and in very rare cases, analyze or predict. So it's rare, but when you think about what we do for a living as scientists, we create and synthesize for a living. And the way we do that creativity and synthesis is by evaluating what's in the literature comparing what's known to what we need to do and arriving at something that we can then synthesize. So what's important here is the Bloom's taxonometric levels increase in, and in, accumulate complexity, so they're hierarchical. And the lesson to be derived from that is specifically, if you want someone to be using your tool in their creation or synthesis activities, they have to know how to use your tool as they remember. They need to know how to use it when they're understanding. So they have to actually be able to work through this progression to get to creation or evaluation. You can't just put them in uh, the evaluation, uh, a context where they have to evaluate using your tool or this new knowledge and expect that to happen. That's especially important when they have not had much experience doing that before. So for example, in the Felden data, they're talking about new graduate students and whether or not they can retain information that's presented in a short form, uh, sharp and tense training. If that training happened at levels one and two, those people just finished college where most of the uh, answers and assessments they've ever completed are at levels one and two. But now suddenly as graduate students, they're being expected to synthesize compare and judge. They have not had experience doing that. And if the short, sharp training was at Bloom's levels one and two, but that what was desired by going to those short, sharp trainings was at levels five and six, you can see it's impossible or very rare that that's actually going to happen. So it's really important to understand not just that Bloom's taxonomy exists and that it's been replicated and that it hasn't been improved upon since 1956, but also that when you stage your training, it has to go in this order. If you train at level one and expect at level six, you will, your training will fail. So that's an, that's an important lesson. This is an example of how Bloom's levels look in training. So I have taken some programming classes in the past. I am terrible at it. But in those classes, what I have done is someone gives me some code and I have run that code. That, that's what I did. That's the um, Bloom's level one. But since I think create and synthesize for a living, that's clearly not enough. I, I can't take a class, learn how to run code that's given to me, and then go out and use that as I'm creating new statistical methodologies, for example because there's a disconnect between where I'm trained and assessed and what I actually need to do with that new information. So um, if after I learn how to run code and make sure it actually does run or whatever, I'm asked to then recognize or match data to a, a problem, like here's a problem, R would work for that problem. That's a matching problem. That's not a memory problem. So that's a little more complex. If you then need to... Um, implement a rule instead, you're at Bloom's level three, 
And Bloom's level four activities, I'm sorry, uh, Bloom's level four activities would be you give a person, you know, three tools, three data sets, and ask them to sequence those things. That requires prediction and anticipation of what will happen. But because the information is at a sort of concrete level, there are rules and systems that can be utilized. But you can see the difference between running code and sequencing tools in this, uh, this list of from Blooms 1 to Blooms 4. Even if the person needs to sequence tools in order, but you're training or assessing them at Blooms 1, you're still not going to get uh, the effect of the training that you wanted. So the lessons from these just sort of um, descriptions of what, what you might expect at these different Blooms levels is are, if your training doesn't go beyond the fourth level of Blooms taxonomy, the people who complete your training will be unable to move on to create or synthesize or deploy your tool when or your new knowledge when they are creating or synthesizing. Um, if training doesn't encourage people to think about how they're going to be using this material or thinking with this material going forward when they are operating at Blooms 5 or 6, they, they won't be doing it. So the last sort of mini uh, lesson is if you can look at the short, sharp session that you've got and as uh, Karen said, you know, there's a huge demand and limited expertise, so we need to run these short, sharp, intense uh, training programs. If you can look at this list and see what you're actually doing in your um, training, you can then say, this will put you or move you to, put you at Bloom's level two or move you to Bloom's level two. Once you finish this program, you will need Bloom's three or something like that. So you can use these labels. That's, that's important. Not to change what you're doing, but to inform the user about what you're doing and what, what they could do next, what they should do next. Okay, so that's Bloom's taxonomy. You can Google the pants off that. There's a whole bunch in the world, in the uh, virtual world about Bloom's taxonomy. There's considerably less about Sam Messick um, and his uh, perspective on instructional design, because as I mentioned, he is a psychometrician. These uh, three important questions were originally formulated for validity in large scale assessment, because that's what most um, psychometricians are, are concerned with. But if you look at these questions, you can see that they're relevant when we think about short, sharp, or long form training. What is this, ex this learning experience supposed to lead to? Is it so in the Felden case, it's possible that they said the training is supposed to lead to increased publications. Going to this boot camp, software boot camp, is supposed to lead to increased publications. That's unlikely because they didn't train them to publish with these tools. They trained them how to use the tools. So that's an example of how using Messick question number one and Bloom's taxonomy explains the Felden results. If you know what your course is intended to leave a student with, you need to know how will you know that the student has acquired those skills, that knowledge, skill, or ability? What is it that they have to do in order to show that they have learned what you were supposed to learn or what, you, what they were intended to have learned? And if you know what they need to be able to do, then you need to come up with tasks that ask them to do those things so that you can see for yourself, assess whether or not what you hoped would be the result of the curriculum is actually the result of the curriculum. Now you can see, and as I explained, very few people are familiar with this and it's never used in higher education. It's certainly not used in curriculum design except by me. But you can see that these three questions, they weren't asked by the Felden et al researchers. And that is why what the KSAs, their short courses were supposed to lead to, don't match the specific behaviors that they actually um, evaluated. So some, uh, in, in addition to the fact that, yeah, the Felden results were predictable, lessons include your, if you formulate teaching objectives, which many people do, they say, I need to teach them how to do this. I need to teach them how to do that. Instead, you should be defining learning objectives. A learning objective is to articulate the knowledge, skill, or ability that your learning experience is supposed to deliver. That's a learning objective. A teaching objective is about you, the instructor. So 
focusing on the messic questions can help you change what do I need to cover into what do my students need to be able to do once I've covered that material. Is covering that material via lecture actually going to get them where I need them to be? Having that conversation, even if it's only with yourself, is a really important way to ensure that even if you have short form, but also if you have long form teaching that you're engaged with, what you hope for and what you achieve are going to be better aligned. And the second lesson is, when you think about uh, MESIC 3, what tasks will elicit the specific behaviors that tell me that the student learned, that uh, if you have in-class activities, you need, people need to practice these new skills, but also demonstrate that they did get the skill eventually. So these are important lessons that you can get just from MESIC. But MESIC and Blooms, even though they were created in completely different contexts and for totally different purposes, work really well together in a curriculum development or evaluation uh, exercise. So according to the Stanford Education Department, learning outcomes are statements of the knowledge, skills, and abilities students should possess and can demonstrate. So the articulation, the definition of a learning outcome is basically a combination of MESIC's three questions. And Blooms helps you think about knowledge, skills, and abilities at the level that a learner should possess when they come into your class or the level they should possess when they leave your class. So you can use Messick's three questions and Blooms together in order to support the uh, achievement of your learning objectives given that you've matched what you're asking students to do to show they've learned what you wanted them to with what you actually do in class to get them to learn those things. Okay, so that's education. Cognitive psychology has delivered uh, many different things, including the um, finding the, that Felden et al. cite about spaced learning being better than short piles of information being dumped. Um, but in a completely other dimension of cognitive psychology, this uh, idea of sustainable learning did come from uh, higher education in Australia, actually. Sustainable learning is learning that continues beyond the end of formal instruction. Now, you have huge demand and limited expertise, and it's important that you tell a person, I'm telling you this right now, and you have the opportunity to keep growing this skill set. That's an important thing to say. What I'm teaching you now is sustainable. As a statistician, what I find people saying is, um, I don't want to take an introductory stats class because I might become a statistician. Yeah, there's no chance of that. <laughs> um, so these are things that if you're committed to continuing to learn whatever it is to use statistics appropriately, I would hope, um, that learning has to continue. Just coming to my class isn't, isn't enough. There's another construct from uh, straight from cognitive psychology called transfer, where you learn some skills or some knowledge in one context in a short course where you don't have a problem that you're working on, like your dissertation yet, but that's the learned in context. You need to be able to transfer the knowledge that you gained in your short form training to other contexts, like where you do have a problem that you're working on your dissertation or something like that. This uh, relates to the fact that you want what is learned in your short form training to transfer. You want people to see the value in this new knowledge or skill and apply it, A, so they can practice, and B, so they can get better at it. But you want that to be part of their habits of mind when it comes to doing research or thinking about software or, or data. Um, so if uh, your short training doesn't promote sustainable learning, then the effects will be minimal. They'll be able to answer multiple choice questions on a quiz as long as they remember the facts that you told them. But if you're interested in promoting decision making or synthesis or evaluation, then there needs to be some effort to promote sustainability in the learning that you promote. So this expression, use it or lose it, is a useful metaphor but actually, the physiological uh, basis for memory and learning is process it deeply or you don't retain it. So that's obviously not as shiny as use it or lose it, and it doesn't rhyme. 
Um, but you also need this additional bit, develop the KSA at the Bloom's level where you will need to deploy it or else you will never use it. So obviously that's the worst one of all because it's really long and there's absolutely no hope for rhyming. But you can see that just by summarizing those ex those truths about learning as use it or lose it gives you an idea about how important sustainability is in your conceptualization of the learning experience that you're designing that you're uh, revising or i'm sorry that's one of my dogs someone's walking down my street so um the next idea that I want to talk about is metacognition, which is defined as the process of reflecting on and directing one's own thinking. When you present a person with a complete set of facts, if you learn this, you will be done. There is no impetus for that person to reflect on their thinking. Do I know this? Can I use this later? Because essentially the only use for that information is to answer multiple choice questions correctly. So the process of reflecting and directing one's own thinking is actually quite rare as a skill that people develop um, in college. When they are successful in college and go on to graduate school, the successful people in graduate school reflect. Usually that is what they do. They hear new information and they think, wait, did I understand that? I might have a question. People who don't say, wait, did I understand that? I might have a question. They're done. You told them something, they heard it, they remembered it and got rid of it on the exam. That, that, will not, that is not the mark of a successful scholar or a successful academic. So metacognition is implicit and some people develop the skill intuitively. But in fact, it is a process that can be learned and improved. So um, Ambrose et al in this epic, epically great 2010 book say, uh, that to become a self-directed learner, which is a person who understands that there's something to be learned. They look at what they know and they look at where they need to go and they see there's a gap and they direct themselves to filling that gap. But in order to do that, students must learn to assess the demands of the task. They have to evaluate it. They have to evaluate their own knowledge and skills. They have to plan their approach. They have to monitor their pro pro progress and adjust their strategies as needed. Now, in that statement, you can see the complexity of blooms that is required. Assess the demands of the task, that's evaluate, level six. Evaluate their own knowledge and skills, that's level six, applied to yourself. Plan their approach, that could be level four, and monitor their progress, that's compare, level five. Adjust their strategies as needed is compare. So the, the to be metacognitive, requires high level blooms if you go through a learning program called college and don't learn high level blooms metacognition will be uh, difficult for you but not impossible and the national research council points out they're talking about kids though in the 2001 book uh, metacognition is critical to any learning process and it is crucial to effective thinking and competent performance so the fact that there's no metacognition or there's no time to emphasize metacognition in a short, sharp, intense training uh, experience may be something worth revisiting. Um, so a learnable, improvable, uh, sorry, uh, metacognition is a learnable and improvable set of skills and it can be applied, but only if recognized in order to develop additional literacies and competencies. So when we're talking about boot camps and other short uh, form training, we are usually talking about someone who's a self-directed learner, someone who is continuing their own education. And it's really important to consider if you can't actually focus on metacognition in order to promote sustainability. So if I tell you uh, this is what it takes to be metacognitive and I'm going to tell you some stuff about statistics, I want you to continue learning about it. I've given you two huge boosts in continuing to refine what you know about statistics. So this is just a picture of how Bloom's, Bloom's uh, taxonomy requires um, development through the hierarchy, but metacognition is applying the three most complex types. So you have to be able to do those complex types of reasoning, but you have to do it to yourself. So it's, it's a paradox because it's really important to appreciate metacognition and develop it, but it's really hard. And if you haven't um, learned it before, it can be impossible to achieve. So uh, 
there are lessons for addressing the Felden results from the carpentries. And I know this because they posted a response uh, stating, okay, Felden, this is how we roll. And in the carpentries uh, stra strategic statement, they have two key strategies that I have thought a lot about. One is meet the learner where they are, and one is explicitly address motivation and self-efficacy. So thinking about meeting learners where they are can use Blooms. So you can use Blooms to describe your training and you can describe Bloom, you can use Bloom to describe the prerequisites. And then when you want to know where is the learner, how can I meet them there, you would match your training to their Blooms. Straightforward. Also, you can, by meeting them where they are, you can say, you know, here you are at Bloom's level two, let's take a trip to Bloom's level three. You can also embed sustainability into the design of the learning opportunity where you have said, you're at Bloom's level one, let's go to visit three. And by the way, there's four other levels. So keep going. By integrating Bloom's taxonomy into your uh, meeting of learners where they are, you can also add sustainability and maybe a little metacognition as well. Also, it is crucial to keep in mind that where the learner is may not be where they need to be blooms wise. So you tell them you're at blooms level three, we're going to take a trip to blooms level four, but in fact they need to be at blooms level six. So it's really important to keep in mind that even if you tell them we're going to grow a level, we're all going to leave this classroom at blooms level four, ready, go, they actually need to be at five or six to do what they need to do independently with the new knowledge that you've transferred to them in this short form training. There's another part of this particular strategy, you need to meet the learner where they are. So let's say you've identified where they are correctly and where you are going to meet them, you have identified that correctly. But to meet them, you need to specify where you're going to meet them and where you're gonna lead them to. You can use the MESIC criteria to do this. You'd use MESIC plus Blooms, but it's, uh, it's a really easy way to um, employ your strategy of meeting learners where they are by thinking, if they're there, what should this curriculum lead them to? We're talking specifically about a learning experience that you've already designed. You're just thinking it through to make sure that if you meet them there, you're going to then be able to take them with you on this trip. And it's also really important to keep in mind when you want to meet someone where they are, if you ask them where they are and they're suffering from Dunning-Kruger paradox, they aren't actually going to know where they are. It's really important to realize that and also that you have probably a better idea of where they need to be with this knowledge, skill, or ability than they do. And finished with this course is not um, usually where people want to end up. So the second strategy that uh, Carpentries uses to explicitly address motivation and self-efficacy, if you articulate what you expect in terms of blooms, because you used MESIC and what you provide, you will be able to motivate them to come on a journey with them, they, with you. You will say, here's some new knowledge. I see Python is scary, said Rochelle, um, and I am worried, but I trust you, uh, Jason or Allegra, I trust you to take me from Bloom's level negative two, which is where I am with Python, at least to Bloom's level one or two. That would motivate me. I see where we're going and I feel you're going to get me there and I can ask questions and along the way to make sure that I do get there. So my self-efficacy is also engaged when you tell me transparently where we're going and why. Um, when you describe the performance level, which is also very messic, but derived from your appreciation of what blooms you're doing or asking for, um, you will tell students, once you finish this training, you may go on to do this and that. That also motivates them to learn what you're doing now, what you're telling them now, so they can then continue to build. So explicitly addressing motivation and self-efficacy is supported by your awareness and your understanding of blooms and your specific application of the messic questions, but also literally engaging the student in their own thinking and growing, not just by putting new ideas in their head. And including motivation for sustainable learning 
for example, you've now completed module one of Python for beginners. In model two, module two, you will learn how to paint and also curl your hair. I mean, whatever it is, promoting sustainability does address motivation. And by making it explicit throughout the short form training that you have, you would be able to mix and match. You'd be enabling the learners to choose a course, to plot a course, because you've went gone to the trouble of actually meeting the learner where they are, describing where you are and how the meeting happens, describing how they can be taken along, and promoting their engagement with the idea of sustainable learning and their own uh, self-efficacy to move themselves up Bloom's taxonomy. So that's all I have. Um, so now we have 30 minutes-ish, 28 and a half minutes for, um, for questions, if anybody has any. And, but uh, these are just some key resources. This doesn't, these are not references from the talk, but I do have those. Um, the Ambrose book, and uh, blooms you can just google blooms but uh so this is uh, probably if people ask in the question box for actual references i can put those on this slide instead of these so i'm going to stop there okay <clears throat> well it looks like we've got a couple of questions that have shown up uh during the talk um and maybe i think we've uh Someone has gone and prioritized those that have appeared first. Um, it looks like the first question was a clarification, which okay. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see. No, that. no, I didn't. I didn't. Okay. I, okay. I figured that this one could probably survive. Okay. Um, <laughs> but but it's a good question. I would like to know the answer too, which okay. is the difference between a skill and an ability on the Messick scale. Okay, so there's. I mean, this is a great question, and it comes up in philosophical debates as well as you know educational debates so it's a good question um in a medical sense so i work in a medical center in a medical sense you have a skill which is like stitching and the ability is sort of um the ability to elicit a history from a patient so a skill is something super specific and an ability is a a complex set of behaviors that's sort of the and that the example is sort of stitches, doing stitches versus getting a history uh, with a patient because it involves a lot more. Is that okay? That, that's the way it's discussed in medical education and like for adults, but for children or in other contexts, it could be it could be described differently. So the the longer sorry answer is there really isn't a lot of agreement on the exact differences. Okay. Um. Another question. Uh, we've got a couple questions on carpentry specific practices that have come up. Um, okay. And feel free to, to kick me off and choose questions yourself if you, at any point if you'd like to. Um, the, the next one was, would it be useful for a carpentry's lesson wrapper to prod instructors to emphasize the importance of applying skills attendees learned to their own research questions? For example, yes. to push for sustained learning after the workshop. Yes. Yes. And yes, I don't know what a wrapper is. And I don't either. Like 12 words. I don't know what you said, but yes. And I, I will go further. The more transparent you are about how limited your time together can be in terms of utility. <laughs> you shouldn't, no one should come to a class thinking, I'm totally going to be an expert in this field when I'm done. Or this is all you need to know in order to be fill in the blank. Doesn't matter how that ends. The answer is no. So the more explicit you can be about how much this is in order to for you to grow. This is in order for you to continue blah blahing so you can eventually blah 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 with this. That's really important. And I think when non technical people come to technical things, no matter how not really technical it is, oh my God, you should see the classes I took. This is not technical. Doesn't matter if it's more technical than they're used to. The idea is it's static. I'll just learn this bit and then I'll be sorted. That's not how it is ever. So, so making that clear, I think is helpful, but telling a person there's more and you can keep going. Look how good you're doing. I think that's really important. Okay. 
Um, and no, I don't, it, there's the other part of that question is, does this already exist, which is, which, which I think uh, is a question for us. And, and I, I don't, I don't think we have anything like that built into our lessons at the moment. We have our instructor training, but we've had a lot of discussion about how to, um, things we can do to remind instructors about good practices like this in the context of a lesson. And I think that is a good idea. Um, so, uh, Here's another one in the same uh, carpentry specific category here, um, perhaps a more general discussion point than question, but I'm wondering how the ongoing discussion about creating virtual classrooms, not limited to carpentries, where all the software is set up and perfect for the training, but then yeah. not something a learner can use after the workshop conflicts with what we're talking about. And yes. Learning. Yeah. So not only that, but it just came up in a, um, I, I sit on an advisory, a training advisory board for um, EBI, the um, European Molecular Biology Laboratory um, in England. And we were talking about whether or not, so we're the training committee, training advisory committee. So we we're saying, do we, um, do we need computers in the rooms? Like, shouldn't we have people bring in their own computers to sit here? So there's 40 technologists and no computers rather than 40 computers and one technologist. So everybody comes and learns how on a perfectly loaded machine with one person saying, now push button seven, voila, you've annotated the genome or whatever. I don't actually know what they do. So that's the model right now. And the question was, should we have 40 instructors and one and just tables? And everybody comes with their machine. So you, they know they can load it. They know they can do it. They know how to troubleshoot it. But as you have pointed out, you have a huge demand and limited expertise, and one person on 40 computers is obviously a better model efficiency-wise and the opposite for learning. So there is a tension there, which is I'm going to go with the university. You have something that you need to do and not a lot of resources to do it, so you do the most efficient thing. Now, it is possible to promote engagement, more engagement and more sustainability by limiting maybe the scope of the training that you do offer and offering more, more modules. So this is the introductory module on Python for you can do it with me, one instructor, 40 machines. And module 1A is 40 instructors, one machine. And that's an hour or something. I mean, you, so you have your main instructing thing and then, a, okay, try to get this going at home. And then the next level Python training with your one expert instructor and 40 machines and now try to do it at home. So instead of saying, it's trying to, um, okay, sorry. I just got a, I just got a question too. <laughs> so, so does that, does that make sense that, that you're, you're thinking about efficiency and that is the opposite of thinking about learning. So you can mix more more inefficient methods in to promote learning so that you're not your super efficient not very learning promotey activities actually have some the options for people to actually do more promotion do you do you know what i mean does that make any sense i think so okay I'll give the learner a, and i i don't see i don't see the person if, if, if your questions aren't being answered, go ahead and, and say something in the etherpad. <laughs> We've got to thank you there. So that looks good. Okay. Okay. Um, excellent. Um, how about, so, yeah, go ahead. Somebody, somebody sent me a question, which I can answer really quickly. Um, this is adaptive or personalized learning. A, a question about that. Can you talk about eff efficacy of adaptive? It says adoptive, but it's the um, technical term I think is adaptive learning or personalized learning. Um, in turn of sustainability. So one of the things about adaptive learning, this is a lot of people um, hear about this magic thing called computer adaptive testing, where there's some information I need to know if you can do it. So I give you a question. The computer knows if you answer it wrong, it's pitched too high. So I ask you an easier question. If you answer that wrong, it's pitched too high. I'll answer you an, ask you an easier question. So using this adaptive method, the series of questions which have been super vetted, super psychometrically analyzed. It's a hugely effortful thing. Now I can test you in this adaptive way with many fewer questions. If the first question I ask you is too hard, I don't need to ask you anything harder. We're, so those 40 questions we won't even go to. Now I know you're not at that level. I need to get 
to where you are and then I'll ask you five or six questions at the level where I know you are so I can I can get an assessment of your ability or skill or knowledge or whatever in like 20 questions instead of 75 or something so it's really efficient in that sense for assessment in terms of instruction it's much more complicated so I alluded to slash sarcastically just waved my hands saying that the computer adaptive assessment uh, a CAT a computer adaptive testing super super resource intensive but also super focused so in the in the context of sustainable learning when you have a computer saying well what do you think that means what do you think that means like that's not the kind of question a computer can ask that's the kind of question an individual instructor asks when you're doing one-on-one -on -one individualized training it's very difficult to replicate that in um, our, not with a human a and b when you want to promote a person's engagement in the idea that this isn't it and they need to grow not just their knowledge base but their blooms level capacity with that knowledge you very quickly exit the realm of uh computer accessible real-time evaluable responses so sustainable learning doesn't only mean keep on memorizing stuff which works perfectly for adaptive training memorizing this because you can't uh, expect a person to be able to elaborate evaluate compare judge they can't do that with a computer evaluating it in real time so the sustainability aspect of instruction that is computer driven has to be at low blooms and that isn't the objective for sustainable learning so so you can say well once you know all these facts really well then you can go off and start to compare and judge or whatever that's a possibility but i don't think that people talk about sustainable learning and about computer adaptive training i don't think those uh worlds ever collide um Berku? <laughs> I hope A, I said your name right, or at least recognizably, and B, I answered your question. Awesome. Um, if I, we've got another one okay. selected from Etherpad, uh, if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, so on this one in the category of assessment. Um, okay. A longish question, how, given how carpentries work, thousands of folks being trained in two-day exposures and disconnected groups, et cetera. What kind of studies do we need to think about doing to robustly demonstrate impacts? This oh, wow. A grant and not a question, so we yeah. can talk later. Okay. Uh, and we look forward to you joining us at the assessment network sometime. <laughs> okay, so, so I can answer this really quickly by just going to this slide. Awesome. So, so yeah, what in, t in terms of impact, and, and I actually, so, so the good news is, I'm gonna tell you a little story, and at the end of it, everyone in the room was able to say, yes, I went from Bloom's level one to Bloom's level six. And in fact, one of them turned to the other one and said, oh my God, I just went from Bloom's level one to Bloom's level six. So when you say, here's what's gonna happen, I'm gonna tell you some stuff, you're gonna remember it. Then you're going to summarize it. Then you're gonna blah, blah, blah. And you just go through Bloom's taxonomy, uh, and then you ask them, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but oops, no, I guess you can't. So I, I, you, you ask them, uh, or you tell yourself, if the students say, I recognize that I went from Bloom's level one to Bloom's level six, if that is a goal that you have, and then you ask people, hey, do you recognize that you went from Bloom's level one to Bloom's level six? Can you describe how that went for you? what how did you know you did that and they tell you the answer then you have assessed whether or not they did in fact change levels you can ask them how do you feel about that or do you think you're going to use this in your workplace or whatever but you can see the difference the qualitative difference in those two types of questions one is my goal was to bump you a blooms and you said and demonstrated that you bumped a blooms that is impact if I ask you how you feel about it, or do you feel empowered or whatever, blah, 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 that might be impact too. Do you plan to use this later? I'm asking you now, but if I didn't move you down a path, the likelihood of you being able to act on your intention to use it later is low. But if I put you in a higher bloom, if I got you from wherever you were to over the threshold into blooms five, 
and I saw you practice that. I know you were at Bloom's Four because I assessed it before you got here. I wouldn't use a post-test that matches the pre-test to determine whether or not you got to Bloom's Five because Bloom's Four is a question you can ask in a multiple choice way. Bloom's Five is not. But if you ask the students to not fill out the evaluation, but write a sentence or two about what you do at Bloom's Five right now, what are you doing? What are you thinking? Whatever, you will have evidence that they are at Bloom's Five. And that, you, it, that's a qualitative change. You did or did not bump up a level. That's a, no one would argue with that impact, number one. And number two, who claims that? No one. So, so that, that is, that's a real impact that you can assess. You can't actually measure it. But what you're saying is here was what I call meaningful change. And did you experience this meaningful change, yes or no? And you're using MESIC to define what you think is meaningful change. Okay, thank you very much for that. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, Come here. Come here. Let's see, somebody's ranking these, so I'm going, oh, okay. with, I'm, I'm going with the order that- But it's the, not me. Organizers. <laughs> Again, if, if, they're, okay. if you'd like to select any questions, you're welcome to, otherwise I'll keep reading them here. Okay. Um, you, should, you should choose the ones that you think are important. Okay, I'll go with the ranking on, with okay. the order on here. Um, regarding being explicit about Bloom's taxonomy and workshops, um, could it end up increasing the cognitive load to the point that it detracts from the rest of the workshop? That's a great question. So don't just jump in with a whole thing of Bloom's taxonomy. <laughs> but yeah, it's, I'm not saying this is so easy. I can't believe you haven't been doing this. I'm saying this takes work. So yes, it takes work. And I'll share some embarrassing things. The first time I tried to Im uh, embed Bloom's explicitly in the course I was teaching, it was a master's level intro to master's students intro to stats course. And I created exam questions, no, homework questions, where there were two at each Bloom's level, two at Bloom's level one, two, so that if they got the first one right, they would do it again. And I could see, yes, you did in fact operate at Bloom's level one twice successfully or whatever. So that's a holdover from uh, the cognitive scientific uh, testing. So you can imagine the homework was really long. When you get to evaluate and compare the I had to write up the answers to the uh, quiz questions or whatever, and they were like four pages long. So the students were like, what? I hate blown taxonomy. So it was really, it was, it worked uh, brilliantly for me and the students hated it. They hated it. And it made it difficult to interpret and score also because I want you to get to Bloom's five. I actually don't care if you can do a problem at Bloom's level one. I don't care about that. I only care if you can compare and synthesize. So I only wanted them to do two problems, <laughs> but they were two four page essays, you know, on, but the way I had organized it, the Bloom's processing they did at the earlier levels led them to hopefully reflect on their thinking and make their answers to the last four questions much richer, which never worked. So it, it's really hard to do it. You can't just do it and don't do that. <laughs> don't do what I did. But um, yeah, it's definitely a concern. And keep in mind that when a person signs up for your workshop, uh, they don't usually do it on site. They usually do it ahead of time. So you can prepare them. Use the time that you have, not just the time that you have in class and make sure that you follow up with that. When people know that the Carpentry's teaching strategy is to blog the blog, then they know what they're in for. And you sign up for the class, you get a fact sheet about how Bloom's flavored this is or whatever. And let's just say for the sake of argument, Carpentry's decides to take any of this advice, then you would be stratifying or, or uh, labeling all your learning activities according to what Bloom's you have to have to get in and what Bloom's you have to have to get out. If you don't demonstrate that you have Bloom's level, whatever, next X plus one, then you can't take the next class. Okay, uh, there, there's a follow-up question with regard to motivation um, that I, um, we're a little bit short on time. So okay. I'm, one of the things that I'm gonna ask is, is if you have a few minutes after we're yeah. finished yes, to, I have to time. go through the ether patterns, that would be yes. wonderful. Yes, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Let me let me get one more. See if I can get one more question in here. Uh, well, did you have a follow up? 
Um, well, the, follow, the the other it wasn't it was a it was a question about motivation. Could it demotivate yeah. learners by telling them that they won't reach the level they need to be at the end of that workshop? Yeah, it could, but then don't say you're all gonna suck unless you try really hard. So so don't do it that way. But but yeah, I mean these things are not like super easy. A B they're gonna be new experiences for people, so you have to keep that in mind. Like I was saying, if you if, if you go through your entire educational career functioning beautifully at Bloom's Level 3, then no one has challenged you. The first time you hit a Bloom's Level 5 opportunity, you will say, there's something wrong with you because I find this difficult and nothing has ever been difficult for me before. I'm sorry to say that happens to me once a month when I'm teaching. So when you challenge people who are not used to being challenged, there's a problem. And um, almost always, it's you, obviously you. So, so that's going to happen. And I don't let that bother me. Of course, I don't forget it, but I, I try not to. I mean, I'm doing the right thing and I'm doing it the way I think just based because I'm a cognitive scientist. This is how people learn. So deal with it. But yeah, it could demotivate people. That's a short answer. <laughs> Maybe trying to make it more of a of a next steps kind yes. of yes. to uh, your yes. <laughs> and, um, but it's important for you to realize that this is this is how people learn. Human brains work this way. Figure out a way to integrate that fact into the way you teach. You don't have to tell them. Here's how your brain works. Blah blah blah. Now I'm going to tell you some stuff. You don't have to tell them that, but you need to know that if you don't support that kind of development, it won't happen. Whether you choose to tell them that or not is totally up to you. The way you teach, I know that the Carpentry's uh, instructional like path is do it the way we said and then sort of riff and then go off and, you know, as, as you feel more confident. So you'll explore sort of what, what does it mean to you to share this knowledge about learning with your students? Do you send them a handout? Here's how I teach. I, I direct all my students to my teaching portfolio. The first thing there is my statement of teaching philosophy where it says, half of this responsibility is yours. Love, Rochelle. So I'm not there to teach if you're not there to learn. And so that's why people don't take my classes. <laughs> anyway. Okay. I'm going to see if I can squeeze okay. one, one last question in here. Okay. Um, this one is any thoughts on in using intensive boot camps to get people over their fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and then transitioning immediately into self-paced online training? Yeah, I think that would be really cool. Although, if you call it an intensive boot camp, uh, that's scary. So, I would think you need a new name. Uh, but yeah, I think that um, if if it's described and executed correctly for the fearful. I think that that would really go far. And when uh, I find that when you tell people how to self-monitor, how to self-assess, and they see that they can do that, and when they say out loud, I don't know what you mean, the, for the first time. And so I get my master's students want to go to medical school. They finish undergrad, and they're in a master's program and on their way to medical school, or they're graduate students with, uh, in a PhD program. When I tell them, do you know the answer? And they, they can't say no. They just look down. I mean, there's just nowhere. To, uh, just say it. It's important to know what you don't know, I tell them. And, and so, so no matter where they are, I don't, I'm sure that it's worse in college. But when they're in uh, graduate school and beyond, there's incredible pressure never to be wrong or always to know the right answer. So becoming familiar with the fact that there isn't always one right answer. When you compare or judge, there's not a right answer. That's the point of judging. That's why it's different from level four. I mean, there, there are ways to explain sort of how thinking and learning work in ways that can help people get over the fear of being wrong, the fear of making a mistake, because that is ingrained in American high schools and colleges. That is the way to go, is to be afraid to be wrong. There's one right answer, and if I find it, I'll get a point on the exam or my quiz or whatever. And, and so getting people to get over that fear, I think, is also really important. Well, thank you so much. This, is, this has just been tremendous. I feel like I've learned a, an, an amazing amount from listening to you. Um, I hope that everyone else feels the same way. Thank me you too. so much for joining us. No problem. Um, thank do, you you want for me, do you want me to stay in case anybody can stay? Or you'll just... Um, 
Sure. Well, at the very least, addressing yes, the question on either pad. And yes, <laughs> if you're willing to stick around for a while, that would be I'm well. willing to stick around. So just tell okay. me, you know, just shut off the microphone when you want me to, when you're done. <laughs> when you're done. No problem. But, but thank, to, thank you to everyone for your questions. And thank you all for coming and spending an hour learning about Blooms and Messick. Yes. And we will be posting uh, both the recording and the slides uh, just as soon as we can figure yeah. out. And the slides are annotated. And, and I'll put references on. <laughs> um, so I don't know how to organize if we're going to if we're going to continue on here. Um, should we loosen up the format a little bit? Uh, should we do you want to carry on answering questions on the etherpad? Um, it's up to you. And also, if I if I stop sharing my slides, will I see more people, or will I think I so? You can try doing people? that. Uh huh. Okay. It, do you know? Can you look at the list and see? Are there any other questions that are like relevant for the slides themselves? Um, we had one more question for we had one more request for clarification, which was, can you explain the PNAS results in light of what you've explained about Bloom's taxonomy and math? Yeah, the, uh, sure. Um, let me just go back. Oops. So, so I did mention a little bit about why if you just look at blooms and look at Messick, you you can see why the um, the Felden results showed. So so let's just look at Messick. The knowledge, skills, and abilities of a short course are not often to publish later or develop professional identity or any of the um, sort of outcomes that were th those are not the knowledge, skills, and abilities of the short course, but the overall expectation is that if you learn these skills then you will do what scholars do or whatever and um, the challenge is the link or the path from learning these skills and being scholarly is a blank it's it's not just not there there's just nothing there to get from having knowledge skills and abilities that were taught in your short form and then being a scholar, that that's the Messick three you, were not used in that. So they had their little short, whatever the short form courses were that Felden surveyed, and then they had their outcomes, which were very different. Um, do you know what F O M O means? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Okay. So, uh, thank you. So, um, yeah. Okay. So, so that's one way you can look at Messick with respect to the, um, the Felden results that in looking at Messick explains the Felden results. But if you look at Bloom's and what I said about what we do as scientists, what we do as practitioners is we create and synthesize after we have evaluated the literature to find out what needs creating, what needs to be synthesized. We operate at Bloom's levels five and six for a living. When you go to a boot campish, boot camp flavored training, if you do exercises like these, run this code that I gave you, follow this recipe to do this kind of work, recognize some data or whatever, unless you're, unless that's what you're gonna be as a scholar, your blooms, I mean, so so in Messick, sorry, with the Messick questions, you can see in the Felden situation, what the short courses were intended to deliver and what the students were expected to demonstrate were not linked because the, the expectation was after you take that class, then six months later or two years later, something will happen. So Blue, Messick wasn't considered there. But for blooms, it explains why that result happened specifically. If the training, the boot camp, was specific at Bloom's levels one, two, and three, even if they got to level four, but what these people were going to have to do in order to be scholarly with this new knowledge was at Bloom's levels five and six, you're not preparing them to make that jump for two reasons. One is the difference between doing this sort of thing with structure and doing it without structure is huge. It's 
it's something that very few people learn to navigate that gap by themselves without support. But that's exactly what the Felden experimental setup sort of wanted. We're going to teach you this stuff. You're going to show that you learned it by regurgitating it or following this code or whatever. And then we're going to ask you how you bloom fived and sixed it. That, that's a crazy, I'm not sure if I'm answering the question, but this is what I said earlier about how using blooms, knowing about blooms, and making sure your research question, if not your training, respects what Bloom says people need to do in order to think and how MESA can help you do that in your class. If you didn't do that in your class, you can be pretty sure even if you were super respectful of Bloom's, it will not turn out the way you hoped, whether that's for the result of your training or the result of your research question. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, if I can, Greg Wilson, if I can just jump in for a second. Yeah. Why do you think Felden et al. got it wrong? Uh, I mean, it, I, it seems from what you're saying that this is pretty a pretty basic mistake. No, this is this is not um, a, a criticism of Felden in their design. This is a criticism of the intention of the training. Felden's design was there to show this. They could have explained it better by pointing out that the Bloom's level of the training was at one, two, and three, but their outcomes. Now, this isn't, Felden didn't set up an experiment wherein people got 72 NSF grants trained a whole bunch of people and then turned in their results. That wasn't Felden's design. Their design was just to summarize what had happened in these training experiences. So we're talking about the training experiences. That's where the design was wrong. And part of the reason why it was wrong is because the people who designed it are not educational psychologists or they didn't call me or they don't know about Blooms or Messick, which very few people do, or some combination of those things. So, so it's definitely not a critique of the design as much as it is the design of the training, which was then summarized. Is that helpful? Okay, good. Um, I think it, it would be okay to make this a little more informal if people want to check in. I do want to remind everybody that we are still recording. Um, uh, so just because I think some people got here late and they didn't get that notice. notice. Um, is there anyone who wants to jump in and, and ask a question that's lingering on the etherpad? I'm not sure stu who's still here, so. Um. I, I, Jason is still here. Excellent. <laughs> For a moment. <laughs> um, so one of my questions is, you know, maybe it's redundant now. I'm listening, listening through and taking everything in. Um, I'm, I'm question, one of my questions is, you know, how might boot camp speed people down that bloom path? And I guess we wouldn't have been able to even see that at all in the way that the, the, the PNAS paper was, was put together. And I'm competing with somebody I can't compete with, so. It's not, hi, hi, sorry. <laughs> I apologize, but there's No, you waited the face. whole hour. There's something on my face. And I, I hope she got it all. And then, and then Atticus played cleanup, batted cleanup. Okay, I'm sorry. So, so. What <laughs> would the typical, let me, let, me, let me even say it this way. Would even a bad workshop um, not too bad, but the general all-purpose workshop that people do now, um, do those speed people down the path? Because speed people down what path? What path? Oh well, not to not to hell, but the okay. graduates <laughs> had to. They had presumably to come up to the same level of of competence or abilities as the graduate students that didn't take. So, is there sort of this like you know taking people even there at Bloom's level zero? Uh, and they've got to one, and that's all they got to. Um, but we wouldn't have we wouldn't have been able to, to tell because this is a longitudinal study uh, whether those students got any benefit at all, or, they, or is it really just that they really turn out um, much worse for having taken a workshop that really didn't get them anywhere? Well, you know, I think that's a really fascinating question in the sense that when students feel that. Um, what I need to know, I learned in my boot camp. They have a false sense of security. They are Kruger Dunning all over the place. And um, a person who doesn't go to a workshop may not go to a workshop because they think, wow, you know, computational methods are just not for me. Or I'm going to go on YouTube and learn about statistics. And somebody asked about uh, individualizing, you know, instruction. A self-directed learner who is reflective or even partly metacognitive can really do that, can really say, 
I just watched a YouTube video and they said FOMO. I don't know what that is. Now I'm going to go to Wikipedia. Now I'm going to do something else. So that person is metacognitively processing and searching. They may not uh, coherently or cohesively demonstrate Bloom's level four or five reasoning, but the way they're moving down that path themselves may confer more of a benefit. The other person who goes to the class and says, well, okay, I checked that list, uh, that box. Now I can move on to the next thing may just not have a sense that learning needs to go on and blah, blah, blah. So, so the, the factors in this experimental design are really complex just because of humans, which is why I try not to study them. But, um, but the, the, the idea is that if you in your workshop or class can be explicit about what you expect or whatever, your measurement of how many of the people in your class bumped up a level can be meaningful. Whereas if you're trying to compare them to another group, it may not be as uh, as meaningful a comparison. Is and that? I thought it does, and I okay. thought of one, okay. one question. I'm going to be selfish. Sorry for okay. anybody, but I think other people like this question too. Okay. <laughs> what does, and this is a little bit, I don't want to say off track, but it's a different um, thread in, in questioning cognitive psychology, so just since we have you here. Okay. What does cognitive psychology, what does all of your experience say about a very common situation that we have in the classroom which is that 20 people show up and we have people that are on different blooms levels. Yeah. They're really different starting places. Right. What are strategies for us to deal with that when we have a class where it's half beginners and half people that are not beginners? Of course, we try to warn them yes. this is for this level and yeah. okay, they'll be the extreme person, but how do you deal with in a class people who are gonna be starting off on different planes? But let's say, yeah they're within, you know, a standard deviation away. How do you still help them? Well, so it's, it's, an, it's definitely a common problem. And just as an example, when I am teaching introductory stats to these people getting master's degrees, some of them just got out of college and they didn't, they took the MCAT and they didn't get a high enough score. So they can't, they, they're just waiting a year. So they're really young and whatever their major was, art history or whatever, I don't know. Then there are people who went to college went took two or three years to do research and now they're just trying to get back to academics so that they can then so those people are much more sophisticated thinkers none of them knows anything about statistics so that's worse i think in some ways than where everybody's at sort of i don't know anything about this but um but uh but you have sort of different blooms somebody who has thought creatively before will struggle when the assignments are don't think creatively about this just sort of fact 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 and um one way around that is to to be explicit you know what i mean like to and and i actually tried this i was um in estonia last year and i uh i knew that everybody or almost everybody in who was coming to this workshop had visited blooms five and six before I knew two of them lived in Blooms 5 and 6, but the other ones were just visiting and like one had was almost about to go there. So that was, we could have talked about creativity. We could have talked about synthesis and whatever, but one of them would not have been able to keep up and would not have recognized what we were talking about. That's only one out of like five or six or whatever. So th this happens all the time. And the question really is pick a level. It, this is actually how I solve this particular problem in an ethical reasoning course. I tell them what what is metacognitive, what are the levels, whatever, and then we ask people to place themselves in kind of Bloom's taxonomy at the end of class. The first time we did it, everybody said, I'm perfect, I'm an expert, which is obviously incorrect. When you ask for evidence, they tend to say that much less often. But what I decided to do the second time we taught it was say, I'm sure you're, most of you are at, you know, Bloom's level six, but I just want to know what evidence do you have that you're at Bloom's level two? Think about Bloom's level two. If you're like a Bloom sixer, you'll have no problem with this. If you're a Bloom's oneer, say I'm at Bloom's one, but be specific to Bloom's level two. So, so you can say, I know you're here and you're here and blah, 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 but we're going to focus on this level. This is where I want you to get, and I'm going to ask you to tell me how do you know you're there or whatever so share with them some responsibility for where they are but also pick a level 
and tell everyone that's the level you're going to be aiming for, even if you're beyond it. This is what we're talking about. For the people who are beyond it, it's useful when they go out in the world and teach other people to recognize evidence from Bloom's level four. They're even closer to going out and eliciting and recognizing evidence from Bloom's level four in the, in the first place. So it's a, a useful exercise for them. It's not backtracking. It gets them more familiar on a meta level with what Bloom's level four looks like. So you're not punishing anyone for being advanced but you're also not creating a sort of untenable situation for the Bloom's level one people to compete with Bloom's level six people. Do you, do you know what I mean? Okay. Makes sense. Gotta go. Thanks okay. so much. Thank you, Jason. Anyone else want to jump in? And Rochelle, anytime you have to go, just. Okay. Am I allowed a second question? Yes. <laughs> oh my God, Jason asked four. You you have up to four. Okay. Um, <laughs> peer instruction. Is it going to work for getting people from levels one to four up to five and six, or do you actually need a more experienced mentor to show them what they should be looking at and looking for? I mean, it's a common place that if you put a bunch of moderate level chess players together, they can spend years playing against each other and not improve yes. because there's nobody to show them what right. better looks like. Yeah. Okay. So A, you get a gold star for answering your own question in the question. B, the reason why you're correct in the answer that you provided is there's something called deliberate practice, not just practice. Are you familiar with deliberate practice? Okay. Yes. So deliberate practice is where you have a, um, you have an expert who looks at what you, do, what you do and says, everything's perfect except this. So the expert set is a diagnoser and a remediator. If you don't have expert diagnosis and remediation, you cannot have deliberate practice, you just have practice. And people who only practice never get better. But it's a commonplace in music to find people who've reached expert level through self-instruction. Right, because they're reflective. They are looking at and recognizing. And in fact, if you were to put two musicians who had that same potential in a situation where they were going to do that, you would see that one maybe tries, hmm, maybe it's my fingering, maybe it's my timing, maybe I need to slow it down, maybe I need to go section by section. That's that guy's approach to getting past. He knows there's a problem, he doesn't know what it is. So he's not good at diagnosing, but he is good at remediating. And the next musician, she says, ah, you know, the fingering's okay, except here. It's these two notes. So she processes before she comes up with a plan, then she executes that plan and sees, yes, that was my problem. So those two both definitely reached the expert level. One took six months and the other one took three hours. But so, they both did it without mentorship. So why is it possible for people to bootstrap themselves in some cognitively challenging yeah. tasks like music, but it doesn't work in other tasks like yes. chess? Yeah, so, so it's not that uh, it's some cognitive tasks and not others as much as it is some people and not others. So some people are reflective and aware of it and able to deploy that metacognitive skill at will. Mm. And some people aren't. They do intuitively apply metacognitive skills, but when they really need it, they don't recognize that. So that may be the only differentiator between the chess players and the musicians. It's possible. But music, especially if you think about playing a Chopin piece, versus playing a chess game, there are fewer parameters in the chess game in the sense that there are millions of options. So you could follow every single rule, but that would take forever. So it's kind of less parameterized. Whereas music, you're looking at it. You have to get from here to there. It's tightly parameterized. You may be more emotive or slower or faster than what's marked, but it's a much, much, much more constrained problem than the chess problem is to get better getting better musically is much more constrained much lower blooms than getting better chess wise so thank you okay i have a question okay um does it help students um uh to move up a blooms to sort of know about blooms 
Like is the, is the, is understanding the context that you as an instructor are trying to help them move, help them move, or is it better to not cognitively burden them with this extra structure mm -hmm. and just yeah. be doing it? So somebody asked a question like that earlier that um, it, you don't, and you, the other thing about short form training is you have a very limited time frame. So um, you, you don't want to overburden them and you also don't want to give them something else to think about when you're trying to get them to focus on what you're trying, trying to get them to think about. Um, what I try to do is be explicit about the structure of the activity uh, in the sense that you're going to be able to do this. I know you can do this because I know you remember X, Y, and I know you can apply Y, Z. So now we're going to try to predict or whatever. So not like super explicitly A and B, it's building. So we do something, we do something else. And then I point out uh, in psychological experimentation terms, I debrief them. But mostly to say, look what you just did. You came in saying, I hate statistics numbers, scare me. But you just constructed a whole sentence about what it is that scares you about statistics, that empowers you to go out and find a solution. Let's talk about what the solutions look like. Let's Google and see what solutions look like. How do you choose between those? What's your next question? So I work the Bloomsish language into the activities in the classroom. Note that you cannot do that when you are lecturing, but they come prepared to ask questions, not to hear material in a flipped classroom. And, and that's one of the reasons why flipping is so effective, but making sure that the students come ready to be, become more fluent in their own thinking, that has to be something you've woven in. You can't just plop it on because it will overload them. And then they don't understand where, am I supposed to be thinking about blooms now? Am I supposed to be thinking about stats now? I can't really do both. So I'm gonna do neither, which is what you don't want. Is that helpful? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. I have a question. Okay. Um, so I'm wondering, I have two questions. I'm gonna start okay. with maybe the broader one. Uh, I'm wondering if you have, so you've, I feel like we're in the middle of that owl picture of like draw a circle, I'll draw an owl. And <laughs> which is good, it's, it's the format, right? But what are like the pro tips of working towards the owl? Like other than like come up with actual learning goals, reference the taxonomy, um, review the purpose of everything that you're doing to them. But like, do you have any more specific pro tips that sort of the novices at incorporating blooms into their teaching um, often miss? Um, by pro tip, you mean like professional instructor? Like recommendations. More okay. Formal. Okay. Like, what, just, okay. what do you think? <laughs> so so you, you have to be comfortable with how Blooms plays out in your class. And so, so you need to think about what is going to work for you, specifically starting with your time frame. So your learning goals must be coherent with respect to how much time you have a person for and how much attention you have that person for. Because if they're there texting or whatever they're doing, uh, good luck. There's really, I don't even, that's why I don't teach in the younger grades. But the, um, the idea that you know your sort of setting, you know who is coming, that's information for you to use. So if you have prerequisites and you can say, you can't ride this ride unless you're this tall. So don't come if you can't do this or you don't know this about yourself. If you have a question about how tall you are, email me. I'm, I'm happy to tell you how tall you are or whatever. But the line really is like this. If you want to know why I have an age line or a height line, I'm, I'm happy to share that with you or whatever. Then when they come to the class, I explain how the class is going to work. So this is a, a semester long, not a quarter, but a semester. So I have 15 weeks. We're going to be doing X. We're going to be doing Y. And here's why. And I don't tell them explicitly, I want to get you from Bloom's level one to Bloom's level two, because they, it would take me 20 minutes that I don't have to explain Bloom's taxonomy to them. But I do try to make sure that everything I do, the entire course is consistent with the Bloom's framework that I have created for the course. So I look at the syllabus, I look at the homework, I look at the exams, everything has to be consistent with what I want. So I use Blooms and Messick every time I sit down to write a lecture. And then I see how much time do I have 
do I need to recap what happened before? Do we, I need to give them some information for what's going to happen next. So that's all me. They don't need to know they're bumping blooms. But when we move from topic to topic, so if you're familiar with the stats book, you know, using a stats textbook, you go from T test to chi squared to whatever you, however it goes. When we finish a topic, we reflect on that. Remember when we talked about p-values and how useless they are? And remember how they were about distributions? And did you remember, did you notice how blah, blah? So we actually take a debrief moment, like 10 or 20 minutes on the last class of a section to go back and talk about what we just learned. And throughout, I am trying to encourage them to be more fluent and narrative about their thoughts that are numeric. So they can say, use a sentence to describe uncertainty instead of just saying p less than 0.05 i mean mischief managed which is what they come in thinking is the actual purpose of statistics so so there's a lot of awareness about bad habits on my part and then i make sure that the coherence through the semester is all blooms based and messic driven and then if they have questions, I am totally fluently able to answer them, but, but we don't spend time talking about that unless they're doctoral students and want to go on then to teach themselves if they're going to be teaching stats, you know, whenever they, then we, then we would talk about it. But if, if they're just master's students and they're going to medical school, this isn't going to be a big thing for them. So we don't, I don't make a big deal about it, but I use it very, very uh, consistently. Is that helpful? Yeah, it is. Okay. Cause I teach, um, it's a one-off programming class, sort of the okay. same. Some people might want to go on, yeah. but for the majority, it's going to be one yeah. and done. Yeah, um, yeah. Which gets we, me to well, my... Well, you should email me because I wrote a paper about that's called the, um, the singleton. <laughs> the, the, the singleton class is the one and done. It's a requirement, but no one knows why it's required, except it is. So the students come to it and they're like, uh, no one's ever going to mention you or this topic again in my anthropology program. So why am I doing this? Uh, you know, you're, you're stuck, but you want sustainability. You know the value of programming for their mm -hmm. anthropology. So it's important for you to be sort of as upfront about that as possible and to tell them it doesn't matter that none of your faculty are ever going to mention this again. This matters. And here's mm -hmm. a bunch of examples. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So yeah, that's a big one and done. Yeah. yeah. Um, my second question was, so we, so this is a programming class that presumes zero. So this okay. is like negative students, as you were saying. Yep. <laughs> like, um, okay. And we've had like, so there's two classes. There's sort of the one after, right? Okay. And that I don't teach. I teach the, the first one. And so we we're trying to place students and mm -hmm. I don't want to like give away what my actual question is, but I'm wondering if you could <laughs> talk about... <laughs> A gender effect in the in um, misidentifying your balloons level. Yeah, yeah, you mean Kruger Dunning? Why are only, why does it only relate to men? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so gold star to me. Uh, but yeah, um, there there are the one one of the things that's important about college, you know is is how important it is not to ever be wrong not to ever not know and that is a much bigger deal for boys than it is for girls and i don't know why because they're i gotta check to see who else is... oh nope there's some men on we we just won't anyway so yeah it's common it's very this this is something that happens quite frequently and is well documented um but what you want to promote, I guess you'd say, is either a sense of intellectual humility, which is a virtue that anyone can develop, even men, um, or a real just attention to what it means to me that you're at Bloom's level four. I'm looking for X, so I need you to show me X. Don't just say I'm at Bloom's four. I need to actually see evidence. When you ask for evidence, even boys will generate some. Um, so, so you might try that, that if the, you're, 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 it doesn't have to be a gender effect. You can just say, we're trying to explore Kruger Dunning and, um, we know that people of all flavors who are less skilled tend to overestimate their abilities. So what we're going to do instead is ask for evidence of the ability you're claiming. Atticus, quiet. So... <laughs> Uh, anyway, so um, 
No, he just, my, come here. Okay. He needs I have to, to teach with a two-year-old sometimes. Okay, so, yeah. okay. He's fine, he's, don't he's worry. five. Okay, you're handsome and I love you, but I'm busy. Okay? Yes, you're busy. Okay, bye. Bye. I'm sorry. So anyway, so, so being explicit about the kind of evidence that you want. You, have you ever seen or used a rubric? Yeah. Okay, like a grading rubric? Yeah, not really. I've I mean, I've seen it. And I know I need to make okay. it's on my very long to-do list. Okay. But I mean, when you consider a rubric, it says specifically a grade work has something element number one. It looks like this element number two. It looks like this. So don't turn something in and say, why didn't I get an A when it didn't actually yeah. fit this profile? That's the first thing. The second thing is people need to learn how to use a rubric if they've never used one before. They're People are not intuitively metacognitive and they're not very good at self-assessing. That is why Kruger-Dunning is so consistently observed. So the idea that people, if I give them a rubric, they'll be able to use it is not correct. So if you want them to use it and don't turn something into me that is D-level work, it says on the rubric that if you don't spell your own name right, I'm going to give it back to you without reading it. No grade, just nothing. Spell your own name right. It's not that hard. Uh, you know, you know, you have kids who don't read the syllabus, but come on, your own name. But you know what I mean? So using a rubric that way, you have to show them how to use it. Give them examples of whatever it is. And that I think will undo some of the um, sort of Kruger Dunning that you're dealing with, but it won't undo the gender effect. Yeah, I mean, it, the, the rubric I have right now is inverse it, and it's almost always true if I just inverse, like, whatever they tell me, and yes. we've... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. But yeah. Yeah, rubric. Be explicit, tell them what you expect, and then show them how, teach them how to recognize when it's aligned with what you're looking for. That's not easy, but it is, I, I did actually, I have done that in my, in my um, ethical reasoning class. And I actually, so they have to turn in homework every week and their essays. And then at the end of the class, I say, look at your essays, your work. You tell me how you've changed and how you know. So on KSA number one, when I first wrote an essay, I said things like this, but that was clearly Bloom's level one. But my by the fifth essay, I was saying things like this, clearly Bloom's level four. I have changed. So, so we practice that through the semester and that's their final actually. But that's ethical reasoning, not programming. So. But I mean, I think that that's doable. Okay, how are we doing here? <clears throat> Anybody else have a burning need to jump in? How are you doing, Rochelle? I'm fine. Great. I've got about I've got about 26 minutes left. Okay. Do you have more questions on your? We we do still have some on the on the Etherpad. I wonder how many okay. of these have been asked now. I can sort of look through here. Because okay. um, if anybody has a question, they can just ask. I hear a voice. Everyone. Yeah, I'll jump in. Okay. Again. This is now Parka. Okay. Um, how do you think? Um. Is there any difference in how you would apply some of these strategies if, uh, you know, I'm thinking about the balance between um, having someone learn a skill about yeah. technically how to do something, and, right? You could have a, a Bloom's Level 6 skill application, right? Uh -huh. Like write a program from scratch sort of thing um, compared to sort of, a uh, higher level conceptual application. Okay, hold on. Is less writing, writing a program from scratch is super high level. Right. What does it have to do? Why does it have to do that? Right. What is its purpose and how can it be efficiently constructed to achieve that purpose? Those are all very high level. Right. So it's a simple thing to do, write a program. It only has to do one thing, but it involves very complex thinking. And this is one, one of the challenges that most experts face. So we're all instructors. So we're all kind of like experts at whatever we're teaching, at least. We may not be expert teachers, but we're experts at what we're teaching. That's kind of the definition of university education right there. You, you got your PhD in fill in the blank chemistry. You're obviously an expert chemist. Now you can teach other people how to be chemists too. 
what we're talking about is is expertise like that when you're thinking about how hard this is or how complex this is for you an expert chemist it's not that hard it's just one thing make perfume how hard can it be it's really not that hard for somebody who is not an expert it's very hard right, right. I, I mean, I, yeah, I'm totally on board with all of this, okay. but, the, but the question was, you know, I, I, like that is a very high level synthetic activity, right? but it, I, I, compared to a very high level synthetic activity that is less hands-on, right? Like that, like you could have a similar highly synthetic thing mm -hmm. that is less about that's more abstract. Yeah, exactly. And how, you know, so if you're having a back and forth, you know, if somebody is coming up with a, a speech, a position speech on something like this, that's uh -huh. all on ideas right. versus something like programming or, or science writing where there's more structure to mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. uh, would you approach those in a different way or is the fact that they're reaching, uh, you know, blooms five and six in, in different ways, mm -hmm. sort of, it doesn't matter. You're still, you know, like, well, how do you think about that? So, okay, here's how I think about that. I was in Sweden and I was giving a workshop so that people were going to be doing something at the end of the workshop. So I needed them to understand Bloom's taxonomy, which in Sweden is not something people learn about at all, apparently. So these are all expert level bioinformaticians and um, we're learning about Bloom's taxonomy for the first time, but they're all expert scientists. So I know they Bloom's five and six all day, every day. And I know they know what Bloom's one, two, and three and four are because they do that with their students or they do it before they Bloom's five and six, so five, whatever they're doing. So I know they've been there. They just don't know the label of it. So I went through this workshop and I needed to teach them about, about Bloom's and to recognize Bloom's and to use these verbs in their correct manner. None of them is obviously a cognitive scientist, so the first time they're ever hearing about it, but because they've been to Blooms 5 and 6 before, I know they can Blooms 5 and 6, Blooms Taxonomy. <laughs> if they had not been to Blooms 5 and 6 before, I would have had to introduce Blooms 5 and 6 type activities for them, preferably in something they're already Blooms 4-ish with. I wouldn't start at blooms five and six if you've never been to blooms level five or six with mm -hmm. something new but if you have been there i can say you know how when you're coming up with a new software program something or another we do blah 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 well try to do that with this abstract something or another so i do think about it very explicitly as i think i was telling elizabeth i do definitely in what i do when i'm making a plan i'm blooms and messick all the way all the time super explicitly so I know it'll work because that's how brains work. When it doesn't work, I don't think, oh my God, I'm a failure. I think there's a resistant student. I wonder what that guy's problem is. I don't, do you know what I mean? Because brains are how they are. And if there's something unclear, you know, that's on me. But if it's just your brain, this, this is how it should go. So I try to make sure that what I'm doing matches the audience, but also my tasks. What do I need the audience to do, to be able to do? And if they've already done it once, like so for example, when we talk about intro to statistics, I don't want them to be statisticians. I want them to communicate effectively with their data. Communicate. If you do a t-test, why? What is the result of your t-test and can I rely on that? So they already communicate. So we use their expertise in communication and just try to introduce new vocabulary. So in that sense, it's exactly like what you're talking about. They're not at Bloom's level five or six at all, like in anything, but they are talking. So I know that they're good at reading and writing and talking. So we just add some new vocabulary and treat it that way. So again, it's not necessarily the, the Bloom's-ish uh, features that I try to be aware of and focused on. It's what, what can they already do and what do I want them to do and how far away is what I want them to do from what they already can do and can I make bridges? So unlike the Felden example where you have, what are we teaching them to do? What do we want them to do? And there's no bridge. There's a like Mariana's trench. I try to make sure there is a bridge, especially when it's something like they're fearful or whatever. But apparently I have a lot of time on my hands. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can, 
I have a follow up if I okay. could. Okay. Yeah. Um so if if you're you're talking about this, you know, you you have a thing of where you want them to get to mm-hmm. um and you're thinking of the path to take them there. Mm-hmm. Uh you know, this bridge you're talking about, is it better to and let's say that 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 the end path will require this sort of higher level blooms in several domains mm-hmm. to integrate, yep. right? So maybe they're going to do some programming and maybe going to do some science writing. They're going to do a scientific analysis, right? right. And that's okay. a yep. bunch of different things. Yep. Is it better, in your opinion, to do those sort of in parallel where you're building all of the pieces together in small ways mm-hmm. or to sort of have those separate so that they're not being overwhelmed by the yeah. growth and all of those levels at once. Right. How would you do so that? So I think what I would do is start out like a pyramid. I would actually try to build a pyramid where we're going, you know, uh, some of the things in, let's say they, they ha- they're they writing a dissertation, let's just say for the sake of argument, you have to review the literature, you have to come up with an experiment, you have to um, analyze, collect the data, analyze the data, write up the data and interpret the data. So that's like six totally different things that you have to be able to do. And like the top, you know, thing is, is your dissertation has to be written. Uh, time management is another thing they have to learn usually. So, um, and there may be ancillary things like programming or learning to use R or something that they have to learn along the way in order to achieve that. So the first thing that I would do is identify all the different KSAs they have to achieve. What do they have to, what has to be there for them to grow? If they don't learn to program, someone has to do that for them. In some programs that that's okay, they can get a consultant in, but they have to be fluent with the results of that. So thinking about that still has to develop. So that's the base of your par- your pyramid is what are the, I- the skills that need to be built. And then you have the next level, which is where that's, you've got your foundation, but they need to be able to do things with those skills. Doing something with programming is actually not a thing. Like learning French, but not ever saying anything or reading anything, that is not how it's done. So you need some interaction between and across the levels and the better integrated each of the individual things is with each of the other things, the more deeply they will retain those skills and the more likely transfer is to happen. So when, when I talk about transfer, you know, it's actually a cognitive psychological construct where, you know, you learned, uh, you studied for an exam in an empty gymnasium so that when you take the exam in the empty gymnasium, you do well. But then when you try to do math in the park, it, you're a failure because transfer doesn't happen. So what I, what I do as a statistician is I think about psychology and I think about whatever you want me to do statistics for rehabilitation medicine, for example, spinal cord injury. So psychology obviously has nothing to do with that, but I did something for psychology. I wonder if I could do an experiment like that with spinal cord injury patients. That's transfer at a very high level, at a synthetic level, a creative level. So when you think about all of these principles, transfer, sustainability, blooms, and their interactivity so that the person can be successful at whatever they want, All of those things have to be at about the same level or they need to be very self-aware so they recognize, wait, there's a gap. I'm not very good at this, but if I learned it, then more interaction would happen and more integration would happen. And then they have flexibility. That's what transfer brings is flexibility of the knowledge that you've accumulated over all these years. So I think that it's really important to recognize all the pieces. They have to work together eventually but you have to learn how they work together. You have to practice putting them together and deploying them in sequence or in parallel if that's what's necessary. But you gotta practice doing that. So you gotta work that in. And if the dissertation is what you want and you start at level zero, you can plan a timeline and milestones of integration or achievement or whatever it is and then make sure that those are explicit for the student so that they know they're on path or they're not on path And then they can be more reflective, like, oh, I'm missing R, or I need Python. I think there's something missing here. So they can have more uh, shared responsibility with you, the director of their enterprise, instead of just saying, what's next? What's next? What's next? Thank you. That's very helpful. Good. Shall I pick one more from the the etherpad? Yeah. 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 Um, 
So I, I'm, I'm interested in a question on here that, that someone put under assessment um, as far as uh, resources. Um, it, it's, it, you, you mentioned that it is difficult to assess uh, Bloom's level five and six, that it's much yeah. more complicated to assess at that level. Are there, are there good resources for examples of assessment questions that target that level no. that could help to think about? No. no. Okay. No. And in fact, uh, what's interesting about Bloom's is if you Google Bloom's or um, this, uh, if you Google Bloom's power verbs, this is if you ever went to your university's um, Center for Teaching Excellence so you could learn to be a TA if you, if you had one of those, um, you will, or a new faculty orientation, you will have heard about Bloom's Taxonomy and you will have learned that when you have these Bloom's verbs, you know, remember, recall, restate, those are activities you're asking a person to do at Bloom's level one, summarize, whatever, those are Bloom's level two. So you can look at those verbs and when you get to five and six, the verbs are evaluate, compare, describe, discuss. So those are the ways you assess Bloom's levels five and six. Ask a person to discuss rah, 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 whatever it is, or compare and contrast, blah, blah, blah. So A, they're going to have to write an essay. B, you're going to have to grade an essay. C, essays are extremely difficult to grade consistently. So D, you're going to need a rubric, which exists. There are millions of grading rubrics for different types of essays. But um, so, so in that sense, it's easy to assess, but it's really hard because you got to read the whole thing and you have to use criteria that are consistent. And that's what's hard. And another thing that's hard is I was um, just sort of explaining is you're an expert in whatever it is you're asking for the essay in and the student isn't an expert there. Sometimes if the student says what you're expecting, the essay looks better. If the student says things you're not expecting, you just don't think it's right. Because you're an expert, you, you cannot see the structure. They use the right grammar. They justified their positions. All of those things are present, but because it didn't agree with your mental model or whatever, it looks weaker. And that's expert bias. That happens all the time. So the, the, um, there's a challenge in sort of coming up with good assessments in spite of your bias, but then you have to grade them in an unbiased and consistent way. And that is a, a second level of, of challenge when you come to Bloom's levels five and six. But, but how to do it, everybody will tell you, ask them to discuss something, ask them to compare something. It's easy, only, only it's not. Um, can I sneak Sorry. one, bury one in at the end? Of course. This is sort of, I've been wondering about this. Okay. So, What's the backstory behind the revision of Blooms and the flipping of the top two? Like what? I don't that know. About? I don't know. And I'll tell you straight out. I don't know why they did it. There's no, it's not empirical at all. So there was no like, oh my God, everybody agrees. There was no consensus. So the answer is, I, I don't know. Now, um, Anderson was, I think, on the original Blooms. He was like the junior guy getting coffee for the original Blooms um, committee that came up with Blooms Taxonomy. But um in my own research around education, I do make explicit that um, every, every PhD level scientist, so I use Blooms for graduate and postgraduate learners. Every person who gets a PhD has to be able to create and synthesize. They, they have to create something new, otherwise they won't, that's, you know, your dissertation has to be innovative. In order to create and synthesize, you have to have evaluated the landscape to determine if something's missing. So in that strict sense, synthesize goes above judge. It, it's harder because first you evaluate and then you synthesize. But those things really work together because if you can't imagine how to fill that gap, it's definitely harder. If you can come up with something but you don't really look through the landscape, it's not as hard because evaluating is much harder. So I think there's no really good argument for why one is at the top. And Anderson at all certainly doesn't have a good argument. Like there's no argument whatsoever. Um, one of the motivations for revising the, uh, the Bloom's taxonomy though was because um, it seemed outdated 
<laughs> and also because Bloom's is the cognitive domain, but there was another book published probably a week later on the affective domain, which has never been read. I have never even, I've seen the cover of it, but I've never actually seen a copy in of it ever. I've never used it. I mean, uh, so maybe they, they seem to have wanted to have made it more unified. And then a third sort of reason is if you Google Bloom's taxonomy, you will find 4 billion things. And maybe there were three and a half billion things in 2000 and Anderson et al. were like, oh my God, we have to, you know, contain, contain this craziness. Here's what it is. So let's just put it in a book. It could have been something. I mean, it could have been a, a, like all of those things. I, I see all of those sort of forces at work in the Bloom's like literature, but I wouldn't even call it the literature. It's like the Bloom's fear. Bloom's fear. Um. Thank you. And the last thing I wanted to say is uh, I, I enjoy bloomsing becoming a verb. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's new for me. Let me know when bloomsing becomes a verb or when bloom sixing becomes a verb because I am bloom sixing all over the place. I think I think we're going to have to incorporate that verb into our instructor training <laughs> curriculum. <laughs> I, I vote yes on proposition blooms. blooms. <laughs> Excellent. Well, all right. Thank you so much. I, I think You're we'll welcome. wrap this up. Um, okay. It's just been such a thrill and I really appreciate you taking all this time and extra time to talk with us. Now, do you, um, do you have access to the group chat? Um, I can see, I can see some chat messages in here. Yes. Okay. Cause there's some questions there too. And I don't oh, know if you want to. They may have written, so they can target messages to the group or they can target messages to you oh. specifically. Okay. I think that's what happened was that they targeted you. Okay. Uh, if the, the, the chat is ephemeral, it will go. Yeah. Away. Um, so, so I should copy and paste things out of it. If you can, do, if you don't mind just taking a minute to do that, that would no, be. No, I don't mind. But I'm going to stop sharing so I have more things on my desktop. And I will go ahead and discontinue the recording. Excellent. 